Hi, I'm uh, Sam Lowenberg, lead reporter for Global Post Special Report on Child Health, and I was a Neiman Fellow uh, here at Har Harvard University last year specializing on global health reporting. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to the forum at Harvard uh, School of Public Health. This webcast is part of the Andalo series on current science controversies. Uh, today's panel is entitled Thwarting Killer Mosquitoes, the state-of-the-art fight against malaria and West Nile virus, presented in collaboration with Global Post. So to start out, I'd like to introduce you to our distinguished panel. Um, we have Diane, Dr. Diane Wirth, who's the Chair, Department of Immunology and Infectious Diseases at the Harvard School of Public Health, and the Director of the Harvard Malaria Initiative, at, also at the Harvard School of Public Health. Her lab has been working on the issue of drug resistance in parasites, uh, which is a particularly worrying issue with malaria. Um, next we have Dr. Regina Rabinovich. She is the Harvard School of Public Health ExxonMobil Malaria Scholar in Residence. Dr. Rabinovich was previously the Director of Infectious Diseases at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where she oversaw the development and implementation of strategies to combat malaria, pneumonia, diarrhea, and other neglected infectious diseases. And finally, we have Alan Court, who is Senior Advisor to the United Nations Secretary General's Special Envoy for Financing the Health Millennium Development Goals and for Malaria. Uh, he previously <laughs> served as director of, of the UNICEF program division and had uh, been posted in Latin America, Africa, and South Asia, where he was in charge of focusing UNICEF's eff efforts on the achievement of the Millennium Development Goals, um, which includes the prevention of preventable child death from disease. So I'm going to give you a brief introduction uh, about the, uh, what we're going to be discussing today, and then we'll uh, start getting into questions in our conversation with the panelists. Um, while many mosquitoes are little more than nuisance insects, some species are capable of transmitting deadly illnesses to humans. Now here in the U.S. we've got West Nile virus. According to CDC, uh, 2012 was the worst year for it so far. In other parts of the world, particularly in Africa and South Asia, people are faced with disabling and sometimes deadly diseases like dengue, which has become a new emerging threat, and malaria. Malaria is one of the world's oldest and biggest killers. It continues to defy eradication despite recent efforts to control and eliminate the disease. Today's talk is going to focus on the fight against these deadly illnesses. We're going to discuss the challenges of mosquito control, drug resistance, and why relatively straightforward interventions are still so difficult to achieve. This event is, will also explore controversies surrounding genetically modified mosquitoes, pesticides, cross-border control, and counterfeit anti-malarial drugs. And uh, just to throw out a, key, a few key facts to kind of set the scene about uh, why malaria in particular is, is something that we should all be thinking about. Um, there's 219 million malaria cases worldwide, 600 660,000 estimated ma malarial deaths globally. 91% of those deaths are in Africa, and 86% of those deaths <coughs> are in children under five years of age. And pregnant women are also highly vul vulnerable. So I'd like to open up with our first question to Diane. Um, what is it about this disease that makes it such a widespread killer, particularly for children and pregnant women? Great. Well, thanks for the question, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I think malaria, as you heard, is, is a disease that affects hundreds of millions of people. It is borne by a mosquito. When the mosquito bites, it injects the parasite. It's a small microorganism, and that microorganism proceeds through the body, first to the liver and then to the blood cells. And in, a, in an infection in a child, the child, 10% of the child's blood cells can be infected with the malaria parasite. It bursts the red cells, leads to fever. Uh, the parasites can cause uh, the child to go into coma. So it's a very serious threat to the person's health. But in addition, one of the fascinating things compared to other infectious diseases, you can get malaria once, and then you can get it again and again. There's no effective immunity uh, from infection. 
okay? So that it's a problem both because it's borne by mosquitoes, it leads to a fulminant infection in the person, and you can get it again and again. And that's, those are the reasons that it's such a big problem. Okay, thank you. Um, so we're gonna start out uh, just to kind of set the scene and give you a sense of, of the real impact of, of malaria on people. Uh, we're gonna show a video clip, a short video clip from a PBS uh, series called Rx for Survival. And uh, this will help illustrate the devastation wrought by malaria. No place on earth suffers more from malaria than Sub-Saharan Africa. While people of all ages get the disease, it is most devastating to children. Came in with severe malaria, severe anemia. Over one million children die of malaria every year. Dr. Juliana Otieno is on the front lines of malaria's devastation. Head of pediatrics at the Nyanza District Hospital in Kisumu, Kenya, Otieno has walked these wards for two decades. The hospital has 80 beds, with at least two children to a bed. 90% have malaria. Dr. Otieno knows these symptoms all too well. She loses three to five children every day. So it's quite distressing. If other days you don't want to come to the ward because a child will die in your hands. Malaria is not caused by a virus like West Nile or yellow fever. It's caused by a microscopic animal, a parasite. The parasite enters the bloodstream with the bite of a mosquito and soon transforms itself so it can invade red blood cells. This parasite that's living in the red blood cells is multiplying and bursting the red blood cells. And the child becomes very, very anemic. And that anemia can then lead to death. And the death can be very rapid. It can be within hours. Dr. Mary Hamill has been fighting the uphill battle against malaria in Africa for years. Malaria is everywhere here. If you went out in the village and took blood samples, you'd find that 80 to 90% of children have malaria right now. For Judith Otiambo, Malaria is a constant worry. She's looking after five children. Two of them, her 18-month-old son, Ben, and her grandchild, Kevin, are sick. Ben has a bad cough, diarrhea, fever, vomiting, and stomach pains. They're very sick. I'm frightened they will both die. Judith has already lost two children to malaria. She remembers the day she took them to the local clinic, a two-hour walk away. The first one died on the way to the hospital. The second one died within two hours of getting there. It was a terrible loss, like losing a part of myself. While malaria can be deadly for children, adults gain partial immunity through multiple infections. But still, they will have long bouts of sickness and fatigue. If a father has malaria, he can't go out and work to bring home funds and food for the family. This is a disease of poverty, and it keeps people impoverished. Um. So this is a disease of poverty, and it's a disease we've been studying and, and trying to fight for quite a long time. Uh, so Re Regina, why, why is it so difficult to deal with? Well, I think the difficulty comes from the complexity of the infection. The number of mosquitoes can carry it, a number of different parasites uh, that vary uh, in, in ways that don't allow the immune response to mount rapidly. Uh, can infect you, and you actually can be infected by different kinds of parasites at the same time. 
So this means that, that we have to be smarter in terms of the drugs and the kinds of tools that we use to stop the mosquitoes. Um, the good news is that we've actually got, have advanced even since that movie, which um, is about three years old. As you said, the number of deaths is down. We know that the number of cases are down across Africa and globally. And this is due to the ability to use not one tool, but a combination of tools to actually have impact. And so we're not only regaining ground that we had lost with malaria, we're actually now beginning to see the possibility of getting it to very low levels in areas that previously had a lot of disease. Okay, so the science is moving forward, um, but I've also heard a lot of concern about the funding levels. Um, and I wanted to ask you, Alan, about that. Uh, According to WHO, total available global funding uh, is $2.3 billion in 2011. That's less than half of what's needed. Uh, they say uh, this means that millions of people living in highly endemic areas continue to lack access to effective malaria prevention, diagnostic testing, and treatment. What, what, what's the, the state of play here? What's, what's going on? Well, I think we have to look historically. And what we have seen in the last four or five years is a dramatic spike in funding, in fact. It used to be very low. If you look 10 years ago, it was 200, 300 million was available for malaria. Now we're talking billions. So it might still not be enough, but it's a lot more. And it, this use of those f extra funds that came in, the three, four billion dollars that have been made, or five billion dollars that have been made available over the last five years, you know, billion dollars a year, it's very different from what it was before tracked perfectly with what Gina says, the downturn in malaria cases and deaths. So we've seen something rather interesting. The money actually works. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, all right, now we're going to take some questions from our studio audience. And uh, if you could please uh, raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you and then we, we'll, we'll, we'll just go, we're going to take one or two questions and then uh, we'll, keep, we'll move on. So. Does anyone uh, have anything for us? Oh, wait, wait for the mic, please. You said uh, that um, there is lots of uh, funds for controlling malaria, and it works. What is it used for? Uh, bed nets, uh, drug development, pesticides? How, how does it work? Not pesticides. Let me disabuse you of that first. <laughs> There's no exterior use of the tools. It's all either on the person or protecting an individual, or it's in the house. So pesticides don't come in. Insecticides do onto the mosquito nets and for indoor spraying. So there's a difference there. I just want to point that out. The money is used for all of what you've said, except the pesticides. So how is it used? Well, the most expensive items are the preventive items. So the most expensive items to buy will be a bed net, which will cost um, to deliver, it will cost six, seven dollars, delivered bed net, so the, the cost of the product plus the delivery, or th the spray, and the spraying, how you do the sprays, the spray, the cans that you need to take, and so on. That's what costs most. The diagnostic tests and the treatments cost less but the money is put to good use. The problem is there's not enough of the money yet. We need to actually sustain the financing, and that's a challenge now in the current financial environment, and sustain it not just to keep at the levels that we reached in 2010, the year before the WHO concern, but sustain it at a higher level so we can in fact invest in the future and start looking at new tools that will in fact reduce not just control further the disease, but actually begin to eliminate it in more countries. Okay. Um, we have another question for, the, uh, for our audience here, from anyone? No? Do we have any questions from our online audience then? Uh, yes, thanks. This is from Jake Siegel. How can we bring reliable, real-time, open access data to the world of malaria in order to have a clearer understanding of district by district caseload, transmission intensity, trends of time, vector biting habits, et cetera? 
<laughs> Who wants to take that? I'll, I'll, you want to take it? Gina can take it. <laughs> I don't know how to do it, but I know that it's very important. Right. And I think that's the first message. Because malaria is complicated and because the strategy that's taken on is not just a national strategy or global strategy, but it has to be adapted to the local scenario at least the district level. We need to empower district leaders to be able to, to take advantage of the tools in a way that works for the way the epidemic is affecting their community. Mm -hmm. And so that means data. And there are new things that are being tried in the sense of not just having one report a year that gets sent in through channels, but using, for example, cell phone cell phones that, that communities can use to send in information about number of cases, number of deaths, better use of diagnostics. So you're just not counting number of children with fever. We actually can use a rapid diagnostic test that can say, do you have at least this level of parasite and, and do we think that it's really malaria? The better the information is, the better we're able to respond and to tailor the response to what's possible in that community. Okay. Well, that's a good lead-in for, um, we're, we're going to uh, show a, a brief bit uh, fr uh, from the series again. And um, in, in, in this uh, part that we're going to see here, this clip, uh, it's going to show the, 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 some of the children that we'd seen before who had been struggling to get effective treatment, and they finally did after some, I, th I think, some, uh, some mishaps. And so now we're, we're going to see, uh, you know, how they're responding to the treatment and, and uh, the difference that that makes. With newer medications too expensive for poor people and vaccines still in development, malaria remains one of the most intractable and deadly diseases in the world. But the situation is not completely hopeless thanks to the behavior of nocturnal mosquitoes. They like to live in the thatch of people's huts where they wait until nightfall. They come out to feed on sleeping people, a trait that has led to a simple way to combat malaria. Bed nets treated with insecticide. CDC did a study in an area with very, very intense malaria transmission. 130,000 people were provided bed nets. And sure enough, we saw that you could reduce transmission of the deadliest malaria by 90% just by keeping them under bed nets. One week after his trip to the clinic, things are looking up for Kevin. When we got home from the clinic, I gave him the medicine and he started to get better. Kevin may not have gotten the best drug therapy, but he survived malaria this time around. And the chances of Kevin and Ben staying malaria-free have just increased tremendously. The film crew donated a $5 bed net, something Judith could not have afforded on her own. But millions of other children won't be so fortunate. Okay, so um, that's an, a nice starting point, uh, the issue of bed nets and funding. We know bed nets work. We know that they reduce malaria transmission. Um, I came across something uh, looking at the stats yesterday that um, the number of long-lasting uh, bed insecticidal bed nets delivered to endemic countries in sub-Saharan Africa dropped from a peak of 145 million in 2010 to an estimated 66 million in 2012. What's going on there? Yes. Don't think it's linear like that, though. Most of the nets, the 145 million, were delivered in that year. They will last two to three years. So don't expect them all to be replaced every year. Uh -huh. So that's one thing. But the problem is not everybody is covered. So there's still a, a lot more to go. And it's true there was a downturn in financing. So not much additional coverage could be had. So we've got two things to do as we move forward. Find the financing to replace the nets that will wear out 
this year and next year. That's the, the first thing. Mm -hmm. And secondly, find the extra money for the nets that are needed for the children born and those that are still uncovered. So these nets, they need to be replaced yes. regularly. It's not a one-off thing. Correct. Once you, okay. And so this is a perpetual, this is going to be a perpetual cost. Until we get new tools that can reduce the amount of malaria that's, or the parasite uh, work in the area, in the geographical area that uh, we're talking about. Okay, well why don't we uh, address that, that issue of m malaria eradication? Is that a possibility? Well, you know, Gina knows this best. In, in 2007, the, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates uh, challenged the world, the scientific world, uh, for eradicating malaria. They declared that no child should have to suffer from a preventable, curable disease. The world did try this once before. In the middle of the last century, there was a malaria eradication campaign. There was a good drug, chloroquine, and an insecticide, DDT. And uh, the idea was just apply those tools and malaria will go away. There's more malaria today in many countries than there was in 1950, in part because the, the parasite and the mosquito were both able to escape. The parasite became resistant to chloroquine. It's no longer an effective drug and the mosquitoes became resistant to insecticide. There was also the issue that um, the sort of, the, the idea, I mean, someone once said, you know, the malaria eradication program in the last century did more to eradicate malariologists than it did to eradicate malaria. The idea was you didn't need new knowledge. You, you knew what you needed to do and all you needed to do was apply it. And I think this time there's really an effort to understand where our knowledge gaps are and to begin to address those because we know the biological drive of, of killing off the parasite and the mosquito is going to lead to what mechanisms of escape. And, and secondly, I think the issues around, you know, behavioral issues around usage of bed nets, around taking of drugs, all of those issues are going to come into play if we're really going to eliminate the disease. Regina, I mean, is this, it sounds like there's so many different factors here that have to be dealt with. It, it feels uh, like this is a, a very steep hill to climb. Is there, is there, is this something we can get our hands around that we can make uh, progress I on? I definitely see the glass as half full rather than half empty. The, the, clearly the agenda, what we're trying to accomplish with malaria has shifted over the past decade from Ten years ago where we were talking about buying, buying bed nets and drugs for children and pregnant women, the high-risk groups, then we really figured out that we needed to scale it up, not only one per household, but we needed more bed nets. The gap grew because we needed to provide several bed nets per household to cover. And we discovered and proved that if you scale up bed nets to that level and uh, the, the first line quality uh, anti-malaria combination therapy, ACTs, or artemisinins, that you could drop all-cause mortality by 50% at a country in children less than five. Can, can you give yeah, us you some examples? You can do that today, Zambia. Zambia. There are other countries, but Zambia has documented that effect, and that it really different groups have looked at it that it cannot be due to anything else other than what was done with malaria. So now the next challenge is, do you sustain that forever? Or do you begin looking at how to use drugs, available drugs now, drugs that could be improved or be developed, to actually knock out the parasite from the communities and begin clearing it? And I think that's the challenge. You're in the middle of the boat. You can't really just sustain it forever. You've raised the question of financing. But you actually have strategies that could be employed today in some areas and those that may require new tools to be able to eliminate and ultimately eradicate the parasite. Not the mosquito, but the parasite. And I want to emphasize the longer term because we need to be hum humble. This is not a five-year initiative. Okay. Polio was not a five-year initiative. We're almost about to win the eradication of guinea worm, and it's been 30 years to go from 3 million to 7 cases. So we need to be humble about this as an endeavor, but we also really do not have an alternative. We have to proceed. Malaria now, I, I believe, is the number three the third high, uh, biggest cause of death of children under five, is that right? Or sec second or globally. third? Yeah, globally. globally. Yes. And In sub-Saharan Africa, it's number two. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the, the, there's the overwhelming burden of malaria, right, is in uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, Nigeria, Nigeria. and India, I believe. Mm -hmm. 
what, I think that accounts for 40 percent of, is it cases or deaths? I'm not sure, but. Seven countries account for, for the 47 percent. <coughs> okay. And they include yeah. those three. And, and mm -hmm. so why is that? Why is it so concentrated in those countries? Has there been less work done in those places or? They're highly populated. These are not only big countries, but with a lot of people. So the intensity of being able to transmit from one to the other. Um, places like Nigeria are not just one country, they're multiple states that need to organize and deliver this package of interventions. And um, the sheer dealing with the numbers in terms of the bed net needs uh, was overwhelming for a while. There's also places like D Democratic Republic of Congo, there are, there are real structural issues at the country level in terms of transportation, uh, et cetera, that make it challenging. These are not the easiest places on earth. This is truly a disease of poverty. Okay. Um, Alan, can you give us an overview of uh, both uh, U.S. and international efforts to, uh, to, to deal with malaria? It's very interesting. The focus of the Global Fund uh, to fight HIV, TB, and malaria uh, has been obviously there. Malaria is one of the big three. And in fact, the Global Fund over the last five years has provided approximately two-thirds of all international funding um, against malaria. And that includes U.S. funding to the Global Fund uh, for malaria. Probably most of the bed nets that people find out there are funded somehow through the Global Fund. And so that's one thing. So this mechanism has been extremely important and countries have found it very useful. The World Bank was also involved in the terms of the multilaterals, as it were a number of other partners, multilateral partners. For the bilaterals, the U.S. has been the most important provider of support for whether it's bed nets or spraying or, or, or treatment or diagnostics. Um, they focused, they targeted a number of countries, 15 countries initially. They've added some countries now. And because of that, they've been highly successful. There's targeting countries, some countries with more of the epidemic, and I'll come back to what I mean by epidemic, some with less uh, transmission. Um, and they've really learned from their success. They, they've taken a very businesslike approach of focusing on the goal within a particular country, working backwards from how they're going to get there, worked in partnership with others, and also been almost a donor of last resort. So when there are delays in drugs coming through from other partners, they will step in and provide. So very successful, highly focused, well organized. Okay. Thank you. Um, I said one thing. I said I'd come back to oh, yes. <laughs> epidemiology. <laughs> All right. Sorry. <laughs> if you look at the map of Africa, across the middle of Africa, you see the heart of where we might call it the epidemic is. It's year-round, very intense. It's, it's, where, it's almost where mosquitoes might go home to roost if they could fly that far. But uh, it's incredible. As you go out from that central belt and, and DRC and, and Western Uganda, Cameroon, Central African Republic, they're in there, Southern Sudan, they're in that band. If you start going north and south from there, it becomes less intense and further north and south, seasonal. And at the far tips, it's almost, it's eliminated. It's very interesting. Morocco has eliminated ma malaria on, in, on the African con uh, continent. Hmm. South Africa has not quite. Of course. Or it's very close to. Even Namibia is fairly close. So you get this idea. If you can concentrate it into a smaller and smaller geographical area, is that one way? And then you bash that area and reduce transmission in that area. So you work on the periphery to squeeze it and you work in the middle to reduce the intensity of transmission. Just one idea of looking forward, how one might strategically look at how you deal with this. But as Gina said, using not one tool, but the mix of tools that can do this. So these mix of tools, you've got spraying to reduce the population, you've got bed nets to population reduce- Population of mosquitoes. The pipe, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> mosquitoes, yes. um, bed nets to reduce transmission to, to people. And uh, you've got me medication once people get it. Diagnostics. Di oh, and yeah. diagnostics, right. And I, I, I had understood recently there's been, I think, new rapid diagnostic tests introduced mm -hmm. that are actually showing, uh, in some cases, that malaria is overdiagnosed. 
Yes, in, in many cases um, in areas where there's limited medical capability, a fever is diagnosed as malaria. And when you actually diagnose with one of these rapid diagnostic tests, you see this sort of artificial drop in, in malaria cases. Those tests have a certain sensitivity, and I think for clinic, treating clinical disease, they're important. For dropping transmission, so as you move to this eradication phase, um, you probably will need much more sensitive tools. Uh, but w what's the consequence of, of a overdiagnosis? Because it is something you hear a lot in uh, malaria endemic countries. Every time someone has right. a fever, it's malaria. Well, you know, they're being treated with an anti-malarial drug that puts more drug in the in the population of people, and it's that we know is a is a recipe for drug resistance. And certainly, we see drug resistance. I mentioned chloroquine resistance. There's resistance in Southeast Asia to the latest artemisinin combination therapy. So, this is uh, overtreatment can lead to increased uh, risk of resistance and okay. under diagnosis of what's really the problem. Yeah, right. exactly. So, and just to put this in a time perspective, if you'd asked that question 10 years ago, then what was on the film is more accurate. More likely 90% of fevers in some places, say Western Uganda, could be malaria, or most likely be malaria. Throughout Africa, it's less likely to be malaria today because of the, the upturn mm -hmm. in funding and, and the increase in available tools to people. So that's gone down. Therefore, any fever, you notion, notionally you think it must be malaria, but in fact, now it's less likely to be so. Okay. We want to keep that trend going. Um, well, maybe we could transition and, and talk briefly then about dengue. Um, I, and I don't know if that's something that's misdiagnosed for malaria or not necessarily, but it is an emerging problem. Um, I, th I, th I believe uh, in we're seeing it now in a lot of urban areas. Unlike malaria, it's not as much of a rural disease necessarily. Where are we seeing dengue and what's the, what's the real threat there? Well, dengue shows up in Latin America where it progressed from Brazil throughout and mm -hmm. you saw it marching across. And in, in Southeast Asia, we do have the vector and so the mosquito that carries, which is a different mosquito, that carries it in the s southern part of the United States. So we're able to transmit infection because the, the, the vector is here. Uh, but it has not proceeded across the United States like West Nile has. I see. But is it a, um, th this issue of, of disease crossing borders, uh, mos mosquito-borne right. disease crossing borders, is t talk, to, talk about that. It is an issue, and we spoke about mm -hmm. South Africa and the challenges they've had in eliminating ma malaria there, because they actually did a really great job of scaling up the control and the package that we've been talking about around mining areas where they had malaria. But they couldn't get, it kept coming back, and it took a little while to sort out that their workforce included people that would come in to work in South Africa and then would go home to other countries that had mal malaria in, in, in those countries and then they would bring it back. So until we have a very facile diagnostic that would tell us who's coming through the border that has malaria or ways of partnering from one country to another so that they're scaling up malaria control simultaneously, we're going to have to deal with these transborder issues. Okay. Um, Diane, let me ask you as a scientist, what would you say to, uh, to lawmakers who are setting budgets? Why, why should they be focused on, on things like malaria? Well, it's, it's a major public health problem. You know, just the numbers of people um, that have the disease mean that it's an important disease and one we need to solve. We also know that if you, if you have an effective drug or, or potentially an effective vaccine, that you can really make a difference with this disease. And there's, you know, there's an explosion of knowledge, the, the sort of genome, um, the genome century um, is now, and, and we really understand a great deal more about these organisms and the infections they cause at a very fundamental level. And this gives me hope that actually we'll be able to come up with really novel ways of combating the disease. But we have to make an investment. Um, you know, this is, this is not something that, as, as Gina said, this isn't going to happen in five years. We're talking about you know, a generation of investment that has to be continuous because to develop a new drug or a vaccine 
takes minimally a decade for any disease, malaria included. So w what happens if the investment uh, drops off and, and if areas that had been getting uh, bed nets and, and medication and so on, if, the, if that isn't renewed? What's the, what's the consequence there? It's called resurgence. Yeah. Sri Lanka is one country that had gotten down to right. 18 infected people um, uh, and now again has gone down to very low levels and they, you know, it became no longer a national priority because if you have 18 cases, you have many other things to pay attention to. And it went right back up to 150,000. So you have the vector, you have the environmental conditions, you have the rainfall, and the population of parasites in the mosquitoes can expand and infect once again. So you lose all ground. This is not a question. This will happen. <coughs> I see. So you have to keep up the levels you in order to... You have to keep up or continue to clear so that your population is protected. Right. You'll lose the investment if you don't go to full eradication because the disease has a very high... You know, the number, a single case can lead to 100 new cases, so you can have rapid expansion. Okay, um, okay let's open up for questions for our panelists. And uh, once again, please wait for the microphone and we'll raise your hand sure. and we'll bring it to you. I want to go back to the question of funding and investment. Um, so how do we attract funding and investment to areas that have lots of malaria, like in Central, South America, and in Asia, but don't have a lot of mortality? So people are getting sick, it's impacting child development, it has social and economic burdens, mm -hmm. and it's mostly driven by Vivex. How do we convince people they should invest there if we don't have deaths to show as one of the burdens? Alan, you want to take yeah, that? Yeah, sure. Um, first of all, I think you need to see how is the malaria getting transmitted and who's getting it. What we see in Asia, parts of Latin America, it's less children who are carrying it, but uh, adults who are working and, and move with their work, logging and, and that such business, which is less controlled in terms of health and has exactly the same problems. They're exposed. Uh, they get it, they go home, they transmit, go back, transmit again, etc. So there is an issue there. So here you see a much greater role for the private sector. The private sector that's involved in some of this in intensive work that's going on that demands the labor. Mm -hmm. So this, I, I'm thinking specifically in the Amazon and parts of, uh, parts of Southeast Asia that have a lot of intense logging type activities or mining activities. And those companies, in fact, are already investing some, but probably could invest more when they realize just how that's impacting whole communities. And many of the governments of the countries that are affected by this are, in fact, in, uh, economies that are emerging out of poverty, out of low income, are middle income, or upper middle income countries now. And are already investing more and can afford to invest even more because they see a return on that investment that's quite important. Number one, in terms of productivity. Number two, in terms of tourism, because tourists do tend to get turned off if, they, if, you know, if there's a lot of malaria. Yeah. There's a stat I, um, I, I think comes from WHO that the annual economic burden of malaria is estimated at least uh, 12 billion per year of direct losses in Africa. That so was a 1980 figure. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's much right. higher now. Um, some question? Yeah. Wait for the mic. Please. Okay. How about the prospect um, or the, the, the prospect of drug resistance and the status of the current science? Are, are the scientists making progress in terms of addressing that? Right. The, the, um, the drug resistance is a problem, you know, except for the um, the newest drug, the artemisinin combination therapies, there's widespread resistance um, in the world. Um, but the new combination therapies, we're seeing resistance in Southeast Asia. So there's a worldwide effort um, to discover new anti-malarial drugs. It was, uh, it's a public-private partnership or a product development partnership called Medicines for Malaria Venture. So there's activity in this area. There's lots, as I, as I mentioned earlier, there's lots of basic research now in understanding the, the fundamentals of the organism, its replication, its disease-causing aspects. 
that give me hope that there will be new pathways discovered that you can target either with drugs or vaccines. So there's progress, but history tells us and microbiology tells us that resistance to almost any intervention is going to appear. And so we have to keep ahead of resistance by having significant uh, research efforts. Um, we, we have a question, I think, from our uh, online audience. Yes, um, we, we have questions here about uh, re-engineering the mosquito and West Nile also. Uh, but let me take this one. Why has it been so difficult to develop a malaria vaccine? We talked a little bit about it, but I know it has something to do with the life cycle of the parasite, but if scientists are seriously considering re-engineering the mosquito, why can't they figure out a vaccine? Are there any promising vaccines in clinical trials right now? Good vaccine. Why, why can't we do a vaccine? This is my favorite question. Uh, Regina and I will have different answers to this, but uh, um, the parasite, I, Gina mentioned this earlier, the parasite um, has an incredible ability to present different, you know, sort of hide itself from the immune system by presenting lots of different antigens or epitopes. So it, it, each time the parasite appears, it's as if it's a different infection, kind of like influenza. If you think about influenza, it's the same issue. You know, you get influenza last year, you're not protected from this year's influenza. So same thing with the malaria infection. That's why we think it takes many infections before you start seeing this partial protection from death. Um, so we'd love to be able to make a vaccine that overcomes that. Um, uh, there is a vaccine in clinical trial, um, and it's in, it's in phase three clinical trials. It's designed to prevent the parasite from entering the host in the first place. So it, it, it tries to catch it between the mosquito bite and when it establishes infection. And it does have efficacy. Um, it, it, it protects about half of the older children and a somewhat smaller number of the younger children. It's not perfect, but it may be an important tool. As, as we said, not any tool is probably going to be perfect. Um, but I think the idea now of, I, I think one of the things we're concentrating on now is can we develop a vaccine that prevents transmission? So actually protects the community rather than protecting the individual from infection. Obviously in combination with drugs and bed nets, so you would be also be addressing the individual infection. Thank you. And I, um, I, I, Gina, did you want to add something? Because I was going to ask no, about that. That was an the... excellent answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't mean to interrupt. We may differ in our optimism about whether that's, that's um, um, likely to happen in the longer term. But I think that it is an, another example of where our aspirations for the research agenda have shifted. Ten years ago, RTSS represented what the target was, which was let's keep children from dying. Let's turn them into semi-immune, the same kind of immunity that protects adults who've been infected many times. Now our aspirations are really to target elimination, and so it's really about preventing transmission. And it does require that investment in science and in product development to make that a reality, and I think it can be done. And if I can, just because some of the questions coming in are about the maybe more controversial idea of re-engineering the mosquito, if you might be able to address that. Right. I mean, there are sort of two strategies there. One is, is make the mosquito incapable of transmitting the disease. And the second is actually uh, reducing the ability of the mosquito to reproduce. Now that latter strategy is actually used in agricultural insects, sterile, release of sterile males, and it has the advantage that it, it's not perpetrated um, in, the, in the population. One of the, one of the controversies about releasing modified mosquitoes is you're going to release them and if they're viable, they'll live forever. The sterile male strategy has the advantage that you could use it, but in a very focused way. So, you know, there's a lot of controversy, there's a lot of research in this area, and I think, you know, before we decide ahead of time what's going to work or what we're in favor of or opposed to, I think we should let the scientific exploration kind of pursue this and see where it leads us. We may get some unexpected results that, in fact, perhaps reducing reproduction, uh, you don't have to get all the way to zero mosquitoes because, in the end, we don't really 
care if the mosquitoes are there and uninfected. I mean, people being bitten by them might care, but from a malaria standpoint, <laughs> that's not the issue. The issue is we don't want uh, the, the parasite carried by the mosquito. Thank you. And if I could just ask one last question, just because we have um, a lot of questions about West Nile. Uh, people are asking if there are any lessons from malaria eradication. There were two questions that we can take to that. I think not so much about the eradication effort, but um, a couple of points to make about West Nile and, and another uh, virus infection that you've had in Massachusetts called Eastern Equine Encephalitis. These are mosquito-borne illnesses, but as opposed to being a parasite, it's a virus. And uh, what we have learned is that, well, they can be deadly, so we should be scared of them, but they happen at a lot lower rate in the United States than the scope of the malaria pro problem globally. That being said, it can be devastating to a family or to a community when that infection enters the community. And what the scientists have proven so far is that vector control, in this case, not indoor residual spraying or bed nets because those mosquitoes bite at night, but environmental spraying actually does have an impact at a community level and use of personal protection, whether it's those things that you hang on your body or something that, that will, will protect you when you're in your garden or your household, actually does protect you from bites of the mosquito and that is effective. The point that I think it makes that's similar for malaria uh, as well as dengue and these other vector-borne diseases is that you need research. You can't just wait until you have the problem in the community to get malariologists and vector biologists engaged in the science. We need to keep a, a base of research going and funding for those researchers to actually develop interventions, or we won't have the tools at the time that we need them. Okay. Do we have more questions from the audience? I'm interested in the panel's thoughts on um, the effect of if any, of um, urbanization on um, malaria rates. And I'm thinking particularly of the projections coming um, out of Africa for the next 10 or 20 years and the rapid urbanization going on in Africa and what, what relationship that will have to malaria rates. Well, looking into my crystal ball, it does affect it positively and, and negatively. We're able to use indoor residual spraying better in urban areas because you can go from household to household. But areas that are very sparsely populated, it's very arduous and difficult to use combinations of vector strategies. So, um, and you're a better able to um, target resting areas of water in urban areas. So urban malaria may allow us to use slightly different tools than we need to use in rural areas. Um, urbanization, creates a host of other challenges in terms mm -hmm. of clean water uh, and hygiene that for, for uh, urban planners. And I don't quite know how that will all fit, fit in. I don't know if either of you have any other comments. Well, India has seen an res urban resurgence of malaria, partly because of this. And because the municipal authorities in, diff in the larger mm -hmm. cities just didn't bother about malaria. They thought it had gone. But it sure came back, and it's come back quickly, and the press is all over them, uh, very right. critical of the municipal governments and so on. So uh, that's where now they are focusing on dealing with that, and it will be the tools that uh, Gina mentioned. It is primarily uh, spraying and secondarily larviciding on, on small uh, places. But there's an old thing from the 1930s that... Uh, some authorities in Africa and cities uh, did, for instance, banning the planting of banana trees. Why? Because rainwater collects in the leaves, where the leaves come out of the stem, and that's where the particular Anopheles mosquito love to breed. And, and by banning that, they actually reduced the incidence of malaria. And so it's a rather interesting right. story. It's written up. It's an interesting story from the 1930s. We need to relearn some of this stuff. Yeah. I'd like to add a comment that there are a host of new kinds of mosquito control tools that are being developed that are actually very exciting. There are powerful repellents. We have some right now. We use them. We spray ourselves. But truly powerful re repellents that you can hang a couple or 
in the house mm -hmm. and protect the house, which would make it so much easier than trying to sleep under a bed net every night. Mm -hmm. There are, so there are a number of different classes of ways of, uh, ways of attacking the mosquito, preventing infection mm -hmm. that you will see coming online over the next five to 10 years. And I, that makes me also optimistic. Well, l let me ask you, since we've got all these methods of, of prevention and dealing with uh, m malaria that we've discussed, we also, but we also talk about malaria as a disease of poverty. W what do we mean by that? Well, I mean, it, you know, the, there used to be malaria, for example, in the United States. In fact, uh, there was malaria in Boston, uh, Washington, D.C., uh, and economic development in addition to, uh, you know, sort of environmental management and the CDC, which actually has its origins as the malaria control program, really led to the elimination of endemic malaria in the United States. Occasionally there'll be transmission here, but it's, it's almost always, it, well, it's always an imported case, occasionally transmitted. So, you know, housing was improved, there were screens on housing, water, open water supplies were um, eliminated. So clearly, same thing in, in Europe. Yeah, there used to be transmission in Southern Europe. Um, so I, I think that clearly improvements in housing, improvements in water supply will eliminate this disease. Uh, so I, I would say that's certainly part of it. And then part of it is in areas of poverty, access to health care, not just for malaria, is, is clearly a, a problem and a challenge. Okay. There, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. A couple of other aspects is that if you don't have 50 cents in your pocket, you can't get treatment for malaria if you have to pay for it yourself. In some countries, we depend on national programs and Global Fund and PMI to purchasing. In other countries, medical care is provided by fee-for-service. You actually have to pay for it. So unless we figure out ways of engaging private sector, and making and what what um, advancing development does increase the likelihood that you will have that 50 cents in your pocket. Then it's really hard to treat people if they've gotten infected. It's hard for them to put up screens or use bed nets or other forms of vector control to protect themselves. Has has our, have our malaria interventions uh, or are malaria interventions generally sort of uh, what they call um, uh, s s stovepiped interventions, or are they plugging into the to in sort of, of overall, yeah, in terms of overall health system strengthening. Malaria helps the system strengthening and good systems help deal with malaria. So it, it's synergistic. There's no question about the synergy there. You focus on malaria and you absolutely have to invest in good staff, training your staff, having the materials there on time. So you have to deal with the supply chain and you have to deal with referrals, severe malaria. It will need a different kind of treatment. You need some uh, a, a really sharp treatment, a quinine or artazunate treatment, uh, injectable or a suppository perhaps. And this kind of treatment you can't just give anywhere. So a good referral system will help. So the synergy is very, very strong. You can't wait for health systems to deal with malaria. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that just won't work. And you can't wait the other way around. You can't ignore health systems and just focus on malaria. Okay. I wanted to add one thing, because you brought up the States, Diane, the United States and the malaria here, apart from the fact that eight presidents had malaria, presidents of the United States, starting with George <laughs> Washington. Um, it's that. So it's aspirational. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. <laughs> CDC, you mentioned as the malaria control program, put out a series, some of the best ever health education cartoons right. on malaria. And uh, the, the, the real villain of the piece was a woman called Annie for Anopheline. Annie the Anopheline, who went around looking for people to bite. If you can get, you can get hold of this on YouTube, online, get hold of it and look at these. They'll give good instructions. The point of me saying this is there's no one tool you have to have a variety. The educational messaging, the creation of demand, or just spreading knowledge and information is such an important part of the overall effort that we just shouldn't forget. Okay. Uh, we're coming to the end of, of our panel. We can, uh, I think, take uh, one or perhaps two more questions if we have any more from the audience. Um, 
Okay, we've got one from our uh, online community. I just want to represent our West Nile questions, which are coming in okay. from people <laughs> in this country. Okay. Um, one from Texas, for example, but people are asking about uh, programs for West Nile this summer in their areas, and if you all might comment on any programs that have been set up, uh, what the measures might be so people can protect against it. Actually, Texas is a great example of the role of public health in U.S. health at this time. Uh, it's very easy to search for information which is provided by the public health authorities mm -hmm. about what they're doing in terms of spraying and what the recommendations are for personal protection. And it's easily available. I found it in about 15 seconds. And, um, you know, we forget that we have great public health infrastructure until we really need it to deal with something new. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, I g I'd like to just use our remaining time to let each of you uh, Ad address uh, briefly what you see as the sort of major challenge going forward. What 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 is what are the, what's the challenge and and what do we have to do to surmount it? Um, why don't we uh, start with you, uh, Alan? Okay, we have a short and a longer term challenge. The longer term challenge is how do we get this transmission blocking uh, environment? How do we get the tools that we need? Single dose treatment, perhaps, uh, and how do we deal? with those that are not ill but carry the parasite, the asymptomatics. So that's the longer term that we need to deal with and start thinking about now. The short term is how do we protect people who are already protected, that we don't see the resurgence, how do we get the funding up to the levels that's needed to keep them protected at the levels they were before and protect the people who are not yet protected, and how do we just bridge the two, and how can we encourage authorities everywhere and potential donors that the more we deal with the disease now, the more the economy will benefit, both at the personal, community and national levels, the more those countries will be able to cope with those, their own situations, and the better overall situation they'll be, the overall environment, the human capital will be so much better off with a reduced incidence of malaria, and once we get the new tools in, we can squeeze malaria out altogether. Okay. So while I agree with him, I think I counted nine challenges there. <laughs> let, me, <laughs> let me address a different one that may be of particular relevance to this audience, which is how do we keep the next generation of malariologists, vector biologists, everything that we need, health services, research, et cetera, coming in and interested in the challenges that we're facing right now? Um, and I think training that next generation, making sure that, that we're applying the best science that we can to transformative solutions, that's going to be our exit strategy for the future. And so I take that as a real challenge and particularly difficult one given the troubles and well, the challenges we have in the U.S. economy and financing for the National Institutes of Health. So we really need to pay attention to this or we lose the future. Diane, you've got the last word. I have the last word, and they had such great last words. I mean, I, I th you know, I think the thing that, that, you know, this is a preventable, treatable, curable disease. We should be able to eliminate it, but it's, it's, it's a biological challenge. This is an organism that's been with us for hundreds of thousands to millions of years. And so I think the challenge is being if you if you will smarter than the parasite and I agree with with Gina you know we need to attract the the next generation we need to attract the best minds to work on this problem because you know this is something which has had uh, millennia to um, to evolve and develop and I, I th it's doable but it's going to be a challenge so I encourage all students to be interested in malaria. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I want to. Um, I, I want to thank you all so much for um, for, for sh you know sharing your your knowledge with us today, and uh, thank our, our uh, audience here and our audience online. And um, if you want to uh, continue this conversation, you can do so online at www.forumhsph.org. Thanks very much. Thank you.